Now, I'll be honest with you, when I was thinking through, which I do in cycles, what texts I might consider for the fall after summer vacation, we thought through with Reverend Stephanie, we picked out all that we wanted to preach about, at least thematically, all the way through Epiphany, which is January. And sometimes I think of myself as relatively smart, right? But I'm not sure what on earth I was thinking when I gave myself one of the very hardest texts of scripture to preach on when I come back from my first day of vacation, uh, after vacation. But here we'll try it. And here we are with Jesus again, who was looking around and noticing some pretty big crowds that had started to mount up and following him. And as he looked around to these crowds, you can see that he had a whole bunch of questions. Because he, I believe, had a feeling that these crowds would fizzle and his shine with the folks would fade over time. So he said something very provocative to them, perhaps even the very worst thing he could have said, oh, okay, so you think you want a piece of this? Great. Just do what I'm about to ask you, which is pretty unthinkable. I'm gonna ask you to disrupt everything about your social structure, about your assumptions about who and what should come first. I'm gonna ask you actually to do the very thing you think you could never do. Because as things go, chances are, wherever it is that you're coming from would probably not be okay with what I'm gonna teach you. And they're not gonna be okay with what I'm gonna ask of you. So go ahead, yes, please do come and follow me. But are you really willing to bear the cost? And then I think it's a fitting question for all of us to ask on this morning. Are we willing to bear this cost? What can we afford? And as you take this trip with Jesus, what costs are we willing to take on? Can you truly, truly afford to put God first? Not just in phraseology or in the language you use with the people who talk to you, but like, are you prepared for God to come first in your life in order to walk in Jesus's footsteps? And I'll be honest with you, there have been plenty of times when I have wondered if setting grace aside, which is not always a good idea, but sometimes I do, if Jesus would truly claim me but Jesus looked at who I am and what I do and the choices I make, would Jesus truly claim me? Because there are so many times when I am not putting God first in my life. And I can even imagine myself in that crowd, right? And, and then seeing him looking around with that questioning and piercing eye where he does, and you could just tell that he could see through to people. Throughout the scriptures, everyone is just like, wow, you see me, Jesus, whoa. You see me, Jesus. And I can imagine him looking at me and knowing all the secrets of my heart, all my doubts, all my stumbles, and also knowing that most of us in that crowd would be willing to abandon him in a heartbeat were we challenged. And I'm going to guess that as Jesus looked around to the throngs, he anticipated precisely what they were about to do when it will become increasingly dangerous to be a Jesus follower or associated with him. And they would all just leave him behind. And he might have sensed, if I were there, something in me that would cower under pressure. Or he might have sensed something in me that was hedging, looking for any excuse to turn away. Many of us are willing to dip our toe in Jesus' waters, those baptismal waters. But the full commitment, which takes commitment again and again, not just once, is tough. And I can't even imagine the excuses that Jesus hears, but I know he's heard the ones I've given him. 
people probably would walk up to Jesus like, oh my gosh, you are just amazing. I love what you have to say. I snuck away to see you right now, but I could never tell my family I'm here. And I think so many in the crowd were kind of willing to let the crowds hide them. And there's something about a crowd mentality where if you can stand amongst the many, then, then nobody has to really truly see you and you don't have to really claim it and you don't really have to put yourself out there. But what happens when the crowds start to go away and it's just you and your lonely voice in conversation with God. If you do have to stand right there in the light, if you don't get to ride a wave, if you have to hold that one lonely chant all by yourself, what would we be willing to take on to do so? Would we be willing to pick up our cross and follow? And where are we? We're in a culture in which Christianity is very much defined by crowds these days. Crowds who resonate with certain themes of the Bible and not so much with others. Crowds who can make it very popular to come and wave your hands in church amongst the many, but make it scary to walk into a community like this where you can't be so anonymous, where you will be seen. Crowds where you can get whipped up into a frenzy and mad about somebody else who you want to blame for all our problems. Those crowds can be very powerful. And obviously, Jesus is suspicious. And I think one of the greatest fallacies of what many people call Christianity is that Faith is all about how I feel personally, how you feel personally. And of course, our feelings matter, of course, because you and your needs are very important in the eyes of God. Nothing is more precious than your truest and your deepest needs. So that pain in your heart matters. The open wounds matter. The stories you haven't healed from matter. And God knows that, and God sees it, and has already conquered it. And what do I mean by this? It's actually really good that we sang that Bye Bye song a little bit earlier, because it's a perfect foil to this concept where, wait a minute, how am I supposed to say goodbye to my pain when I'm up to walk out of church in the same pain I walked in with? My arthritis is not going to get killed by saying bye bye. My heartache is not going to be over just because I said bye-bye. But what I love about these songs that have that hopeful proclamation, that claim of God's victory over the biggest problems of the world, that claim of God's victory over anything that would separate us from our joy and the fullness of being able to live exactly as God created us to be, what these songs proclaim is that God has said that at some point, in the full arc of your life, you won't have that pain anymore. At some point in your story, it will all be good. Meanwhile, the struggle is real. And in order to get to the part of our stories where the healing that we control can happen, and some of that is in our hands. A lot of it is not, but some of it is. There has to be some self-examination, and there has to be a willingness to pay the cost. So yes, God has resolved the outcomes of our struggles and already decided what it means to win, which most often does not at all echo how winning works in our culture. And God has already appointed that better way that each of our stories will meet. And that's what victory means. That God has declared a victory for us. And there's a place where no opponent or enemy or oppressive structure or family history or hiccup or diagnosis or anything 
anything that hurts could separate us from God's victory for us because God's love is working. And God is effective. But sometimes we are clinging to things that can get in the way of the part of the healing we control in our lives. And sometimes we place our own barriers before God. And sometimes we even hedge. And we hold God at a distance. And God's people at a distance. And I think this is what Jesus is getting at in this difficult text. Household and family structures in 2019 have a whole host of topics that are too hot to handle and too cold to hold, and forgive me for quoting him. But so many of us can't even talk about what's on our hearts in our own homes. And Jesus' words may sound harsh, right? But I think he's saying that if we want to give ourselves to God, whatever that might mean, we're going to have to make some significant changes. Changes in decision-making, changes at work, and even changes at home. And nothing can nor should anything be the same in our lives when we follow Jesus. So when Jesus says these words, whoever comes to me and does not hate father or mother, wife or children, brother and sister, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. As is always the case with Jesus, you're supposed to hear his overall message. Now step back from this and realize some of the places in our family structures and substitute the word hate with say no to. And now might you see some healing. Because in many family structures, in many households, Pain starts right there. The oppression starts right there. The sort of grinding down to our smallest selves can start right in some households. Not all, but some. And what Jesus is giving us permission to see is that whatever home is to us, if it is harming us, Jesus says no to that. And you have to hate that. And you can say no, and you can walk away from it, and you are empowered to do that. And if some preacher ever says to you, no, home is perfect, focus on the family, do what we say, and home is harming, harming, harming you, then I wonder if they've read Jesus in Luke, who says that there may be some things about wherever you come from that need to be resisted and said no to, and maybe even hated. Don't hate a person, but hate a behavior if it's harming you. And discipleship means saying no to harmful structures, even when we're right in the middle of them. Most who are interested in doing harm would rather pretend Jesus never said any of this. And there are certainly tons of people who love to pick and choose what we're going to listen to from Scripture, and I'm one of them. I'll be honest. But that's why I picked a text I didn't want to preach on. And as I prayed with God, having listened to so many of you over the past few days, weeks, months, and years, and your own stories of places where you need to look and examine and find the strength from God to claim victory in your life over. Please hear God saying, I am with you in this struggle. I do not stand for how people harm you. And I intend your healing. But it means, I don't want to use Faulkner's words exactly. So he says, kill your darlings, don't kill your darlings. But what I do appreciate about what Faulkner is getting at is that there are places with our darlings that we have to examine, even some of the most cherished places we go. And when they aren't good for us, we don't kill them, but we do have to wonder what God wants us to do with them. So is there something close to you 
that needs close examination? And of course, the answer, by the way, is yes. <laughs> it's true for everyone. Because so much in our world is broken, even in our innermost circles. And it's absolutely true that some of our most trusted confidants will hold faster traditions and assumptions that serve as an existential threat to us. But in this text, Jesus says, no. The Holy Spirit is not up to support any threat to you. The Holy Spirit has victory for you. This is hard. It's really, really tough to shift in a place that's always been ours. And you may not need this. This word may not apply to you so much, but I bet you it does to one of the very closest people in your life. And if you can examine and listen and see amongst you where it would be important to call someone into the protection of God that might be outside of the things they've been used to, Hear God calling us all to that. And by the way, a country could be a household. In Jesus' name, amen.